This morning we celebrate the fourth Sunday in Advent, and our sermon this morning is based upon the epistle which we heard coming to us from St. Paul's letter written to the Philippians, beginning in the fourth chapter. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, my dear friends in our Lord Jesus Christ, this short epistle written or referred to as the letter to the Philippians is, is somewhat short in length. It's only four chapters long, uh, but certainly this is a one of the letters that was written by St. Paul when he was in captivity, being held in prison there in Rome. The importance of this letter is, despite its brevity, despite the fact of being only four chapters in length, as I stated, is quite profound because, you see, Philippi was the earliest church founded by St. Paul. If we look over to the 16th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, we can read about this or read or reference this. So, again... The history between the church at Philippi and St. Paul is quite profound. As I stated, he founded the church. It was his first church that he founded, and as a result, their connections were very deep. And so St. Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi to encourage them in their faith because as I mentioned, St. Paul was being held captive. He was being held prisoner. And so this saddened them, the church at Philippi, because they always remained, had connections, and supported St. Paul. And so his captivity, I'm sure, had a great negative impact on them. And so he's writing this letter to them, to encourage them in their faith. We begin in this morning's epistle passage, which we heard, which began actually in the fourth verse. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Certainly this is very important for us to, as Christians to refer back to and to think about rejoice in the Lord always, because you know better than I do in life, it is easy to get depressed, quite frankly. Let's, let's just lay our cards on the table. If we wanted to, we could spend all of our days, and some of us do, including me at times, we could spend all of our time getting depressed about this, that, and the other. As I've mentioned before, and as we've talked about, turn on the nightly news. All of it is, 90% of it is negative. Every single bit of it is negative. And you, you, quite frankly, you get depressed just watching it. All the murders and all the robberies and the crime and this and that and the other. Who needs all of that? Life is difficult enough. Who needs to know about all that? So again... It's good for us to be reminded to rejoice in the Lord always. If we look elsewhere in Scripture, specifically in the first chapter of St. Luke's Gospel, we hear what's mentioned as the Magnificat of Our Lady. In other words, Our Blessed Lady is speaking. And she says specifically, And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. As Christians, we are called to rejoice at the blessings that God has given to us, whether it be the roof over our head, whether it be the food on our table, whether it be the clothes on our back. But specifically, we should rejoice in the fact that we are given the opportunity to be born again, to have a relationship with with our blessed Savior, and rejoice in the fact that God loves us so much that he sent his Son into the world to die for our sins. 
Elsewhere, further on in St. Luke's Gospel, in the 10th chapter, there became a discussion about the disciples and the apostles and the power that they welded. In other words, they were amazed that they were able to do such great things in our blessed Lord's name. And he cautioned them because he said, don't get so caught up in these great powers that you have, these great things that you can do in my name, but rather emphasize what is truly important. And so he said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You see, friends, we might be able to do all things through God, and it very well may be true that nothing will hurt us, as our Lord says. But despite the miraculous qualities of what I just mentioned, the one thing that should amaze us and gratify us the most is the fact that our names are written in heaven. Again, this is what we should truly rejoice in. St. Paul goes on to mention, let your moderation be known unto all men. And in some translations, moderation appears as forbearance. But, again, as the name mentions, moderate, meaning being moderate in all things, acting with restraint, avoiding all excesses. If we look elsewhere in Scripture, in the first letter to the Corinthians in the ninth chapter, we hear the following, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, in all things. Christians, as I mentioned, are called to be moderate, to be temperate, not to be excessive, not to act with, uh, they're supposed to act with restraint. Certainly, we are given to excesses. We like to do things, human beings I'm speaking about in general now. But we like to do things, we go overboard sometimes. We eat too much, that's called gluttony. We drink too much, that's called drunkenness. We want too much, we want too many possessions, that's called greed or avarice. St. Paul is reminding the Philippians as he's reminding us. We should avoid excesses in all of these things. It's nice to have a nice drink every now and then. It's nice to have a good meal every day. Don't get me wrong. It's certainly nice to have a nice home and possessions, but yet we should not be excessive in these things, number one. But more importantly, as I mentioned previously, our rejoicing, our gladness, should not be in the things that we own, but rather our rejoicing and gladness and happiness should be in the fact that we know our names are written in heaven. St. Paul continues, The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. The Lord is at hand could have two meanings, if you will. The first is the nearness of the Lord to the believer, or secondly, the nearness and time of his coming. Of course, during Advent, we are preparing for the coming of the Lord. On Christmas Day, we remember or we 
when our Lord was born as a small child, when he came into the world. But we know as Christians that our Lord will come again at his second coming. And so we're always called to prepare, prepare for that time. But yet, again, as I mentioned, this could be the Lord is at hand, could also mean the Lord is close to us in the nearness of our heart. As we hear it said, be careful for nothing. Also, it means in nothing be anxious. In St. Matthew's Gospel, in the sixth chapter, we hear a good, a good example of our Lord talking about this to his disciples. We hear him say, Therefore I say to you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Again, our Lord is saying directly to the apostles and to us, don't worry about food, don't worry about clothing, don't worry about life in general. Know that your Lord is always with you and was always there to take care of you. <clears throat> and he continues on to the seventh verse in today's epistle. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, this word, peace of God, is something that we should focus on, and quite frankly, the whole world should focus on, especially at this time of year, when we hear so much about the violence of killing, the violence of wars, the violence of, of hatred. Certainly, the peace of God is what will lead us forward. It's the only thing that will lead us forward, quite frankly. All these other things, as we've been speaking about, that people put their trust in, that people put their hopes in, especially at Christmas time. I hope I get this. I hope I get this. I hope Santa Claus is good to me this year. All of these things are fine, but the point being is, None of them hold a candle to the peace of God. And that only comes through a personal Savior, a personal relationship, rather, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. As we hear in the Colossians, in the third chapter, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Again, we are called to let the peace of God rule in our hearts. As we hear elsewhere, where your heart is, you'll find your treasure. Certainly, our treasure is our relationship with God. And if that is what fills our heart, we'll know that's what our true treasure is. And finally, our Lord's words could make it no plainer. We hear in St. John's Gospel in the 14th, 14th chapter, we hear our Lord saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Our Lord offers us true peace. The world only offers us more anxiety. Let us turn to our blessed Savior so that we can give the, have the peace that only He can give. Let us have the peace that only He can give to the world, that only He offers. The world only offers us anxieties and troubles and tribulations. But the Lord offers us peace, so let us run to him so that we can have the peace that he offers to us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.